Welcome to the Ventura County Astronomical Society's general meeting. My name is Reza, and I'm the Vice President of Orange County Astronomers. OCA is happy to join forces with VCAS to make this event happen. Before we start the main talk, I would like to point out to you the ways in which you can interact with us. First is the raise hand function. Please go ahead and find the raise hand button and click on it. This is how we're going to go to applaud our speaker shortly. Excellent. I see people raising their hands. Thank you very much. Uh, second, look for the chat menu item. This is how you can send us any comments you may have. Third and last, please find the Q&A option on your screen and look for ask a question button. This is where you can ask our speaker questions during and after his presentation. With this, I'm handing it over to Keith uh, for the program tonight. Keith. Reza, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everybody from Orange County Astronomers, Ventura County Astronomical Society, and anybody anywhere in the world that just happened to be joining us tonight, we have a great meeting in store. I'd like to say that with Reza, I'm also joined by our uh, Vice President of Programs, David Contreras. David Contreras is working on a stellar program for the fall. We're going back live again, meeting at Moore Park College. Looks like we'll probably have Dr. Ben Zuckerman. We've spoken for us before, um, violent interplanetary events, and why SETI would fail are two of the topics. We're looking forward to having him once again, looking forward to meeting again in person. David, thank you very much for putting all of this together. Also, I'm joined with by Todd Mitchell, who put our calendar together and does most of our marketing and product development. Todd, it's great to have you. Todd has seen the documentary, which Will Henry is going to talk about. And Todd even has uh, the book by Dr. Gerard O'Neill, and he's going to have some, yes, thank you, Todd. And he'll have uh, definitely some informed comments. The one person who could not make it and really wanted to was Dr. Mark Raymond. Uh, however, he did take the time to write an introduction, and I would like to read that to you now from Dr. Mark Raymond. I am so disappointed I cannot join this meeting to learn more about the documentary on Jerry O'Neill. I know I'll miss an interesting and insightful discussion with Will Henry. As I described in my recent TED Talk, and I hope that some of you have watched it, and yes, VCAS members, we did watch it. I fell in love with space and science when I was four, and my passion for it has never wavered. I was greatly inspired by Professor O'Neill even before I arrived at Princeton to major in physics, where he was a professor. I was thrilled to meet him on several occasions, he published The High Frontier while I was a student in there, and I treasure my autographed copy of his book. Wow, he has an autographed copy of the book. Uh, to continue with Dr. Mark Raymond, he described a future that was not only exciting and important, but was possible during my lifetime. This was not a fantasy, but rather serious projections of how humankind could truly become a spacefaring species. He was a wonderful visionary because he had a deep understanding of what was necessary to achieve his vision. He offered a future that I wanted to be part of, a future that I wanted to live in, and a future I thought could arrive sooner rather than later. And as we all know at VCAS, Dr. Mark Raymond has been very much a part of building that future for all of us. Now, that brings us to our featured guest, Will Henry. Will Henry is an award-winning producer and documentary filmmaker with over 10 years of experience as a developmental executive director, field producer, writer, and story producer. He recently produced and wrote The High Frontier, the untold story of Gerard K. O'Neill, which uncovers the legacy of the space visionary Gerard K. O'Neill, whose activism and 1977 book, The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space, 
sparked a grassroots movement to build Earth-like habitats in space in order to solve Earth's greatest crisis. Previously working in film and television development at Tribeca Film and Cindy Cowan Entertainment, Will is now the creative director and senior producer at Multiverse Media, a media company focusing on space exploration, science, and technology. The company is owned and spearheaded by space industry leader and CEO of Voyager Space Holdings, Dylan Taylor. Will is currently overseeing development and production of Multiverse Media's upcoming eight-part series, The Overview Effect, a TV series in association with NASA. We are all looking forward to that, but tonight, Will, take it away and tell us more about The High Frontier and why he, uh, Gerard O'Neill so much fascinated you. Will. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Can You can hear me all right, good. Um, yeah, absolutely, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here, it's a pleasure. And uh, should I jump right into the presentation? Is that a, the best way to go about this? Yeah, cool, let's do it. All right, let me just get this up for you. Okay. Okay, well, um, as Keith mentioned, the movie's name is The High Frontier, the untold story of Gerard K. O'Neill. Um, this, uh, there's a lot to go through. There's a lot I've prepared for you guys today. Um, the original presentation I made actually only focused on the film, but I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, Jerry's life even before the film, um, and then about our team, the making of. So um, I, I think it'll be quite interesting to all of you guys. Um, so we'll start at the beginning here. Jerry was born. He was born in 1927 and lived ma the majority of his childhood in Speculator, New York. He was the only child of two well-established parents who were major socialites. And Jerry gained a, a great deal of knowledge about society and human nature from his parents and their elite friends, uh, which would come full circle uh, for a circle later on. Um, he also spent a great deal of time working on engineering projects with his father. Um, and a pivotal moment in his life that a lot of people referred to in his upbringing was that he, he visited the 1937 World's Fair as a toddler. And uh, most importantly, he saw the GM Futurama World of Tomorrow, which was a, a sort of a famous engineering moment in history. And he was there as a kid and he, he certainly ate it up and ran with it. Um, and then around age 17, he joined the Navy. Um, and he, uh, he was actually ahead of his time. He, the legal age was 18. But he got in at 17 because he was smart enough to pass a loophole exam, apparently, uh, which allowed him to fulfill his sense of duty ahead of, ahead of time. Um, he was actually stationed near Iwo Jima uh, for some time, but the war ended soon after he joined. So he was restationed to the, the, the Bikini Atoll nuclear test. And this was a really uh, formative moment in his life because you, you take a 17, 18 year old kid who's mildly interested in physics and you put him on the front line of working radio engineering at the Bikini, Bikini Atoll nuclear tests. And it, it, it made a, an enormous impression on him. It opened his eyes to curiosity about science. And when he was uh, uh, brought back to the States, he ended up getting his degree in physics. Um, so he took a, an interest pretty quickly to high energy physics. Um, and while he was looking for that sort of big break in his early career, he got the opportunity to work on an early particle accelerator. Um, and it, in the course of his studies, he had a little bit of an epiphany moment, well, not a little bit, a, a major epiphany moment uh, that solved a problem that scientists previously had with the, the particle accelerator device. Um, and it, it, it basically, the original particle accelerators limited his, their ability to spend time looking at subatomic particles. He designed, designed something called the particle storage ring, which became the um, sort of design for every particle accelerator ever since. And this allowed scientists and physicists to study the subatomic particles uh, for a much longer period um, uh, of time. And so that was a major breakthrough um, and it actually paved the way for the major particle accelerators we know of today. So CERN, you'll see here on, in Switzerland is on the left, this is SLAC, this is at Stanford University on the right. Um, if you know about particle accelerators, you probably know about these two. Um, and they would not exist without that epiphany he had one day um, about how to, how to achieve a longer period of observation time with subatomic particles. And um, it's 
widely known that he should have won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, full stop, he should have won it. Um, there's only two problems, is that one, when they finally realized how big of a breakthrough this was, um, he had died. Um, and two, he by then had also become a little bit, or right prior to his, his passing, he had become a bit of a science popularizer. He was sort of in the markets of, of the Carl Sagan's of the world. And that is a kiss of death to this Nobel Prize committee, committee apparently. <laughs> um, and so he was unable to, to, uh, to really even be in the running by the time that he, he uh, got to that point. And I, a little bit of the backstory actually there is that some other people were nominated for the work he did and won the work, won the prize for the work he did, which is sort of, sort of not a great thing, um, but <laughs> sort of, okay, so moving on. Um, there's a lot that happens between that point. This was around the early to late, well, the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and uh, there's a lot that happens there. There's a lot more in the book, the companion book that goes along with the movie, which I'll talk about later. But where our story really begins is in, at Princeton University in 1969. Um, and so this was a time when physicists were vilified. Um, they were blamed for the evils of the war. You know, there was the creation of uh, uh, napalm bombing, which is a scientific feat. There was the nuclear bomb, which is a major uh, uh, part of the war. And so physicists were blamed for a lot of those things. This is, this is the height of the Vietnam War. Um, and so Jerry believed that he had to teach his students that, that phys uh, physics could be used for good and not just for ill. Um, not only that, he was really uh, a, a big believer in teaching students how to solve practical world problems and along the way teaching them the physics uh, uh, as sort of like a, a B story to the, to the, to the end game of, 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 of reaching the, the uh, uh, answers to all the equations they would be looking at. Um, and so he created a small focus group of sort of high achieving students to look at major world problems to sort of be a little bit of a Princeton think tank with him. Um, he always wanted to achieve above and he would ask them questions uh, every other week to look at and they would use physics, uh, first principles of physics to solve them. And the first, or rather, I'm sure it wasn't the first actually, it was just one of the questions he asked them was, is the surface of a planet the right place for an expanding technological civilization? Um, and so those students took that and, and spent about a week and a half going back to first principles and, and studying the, the mechanics, the cost, the, the, um, the best case scenarios, the worst case scenarios of the question. And they determined that the answer was no. Um, the surface of a planet was not the best place to build a, um, an expanding technological civilization. There was a better place that we do know of. Um, and that place was at places called the Lagrangian point. And um, if you don't know what a Lagrangian point is, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call do know what that is, um, these are, and the most popular ones, by the way, are L5 and L, uh, L4, um, so that might ring a bell. Um, there's actually something called the L5 Society back at this time, which I can get into later. Um, but uh, these were places in space, equidistant from the Earth and Moon, um, that were, uh, that were prime for placing things that would be considered a space habitat. They were stable gravity where you could place something and it would not fly, fly out of our universe. It would not fly away from the earth. It would not crash into the earth. It wouldn't crash into the moon. Um, and if you could get the science good enough to build things there, it could be very long standing. You could put heavy industry there. Um, and so he realized that this, this was a bit of a breakthrough because there was a term at the time called planetary chauvinism. And it was really the idea of landing on a planet and, and building on a planet was all we were thinking about. We just landed on the moon. And he said, I think there's a better case to be made here. And I think it's going to be more cost efficient and better for the long haul. So he spent the next couple of years writing about it. Um, he'd been trying and trying and trying to get it published in articles or rather in magazines and newspapers. And he, he, he finally did in September of 1974 in Physics Today. Um, and he laid this out, first principle, it was a relatively boring article if you read it, I read it and it's, it, to me it's a little bit boring, but what it really was was a profound statement about our breakout into space. It was saying, if we're gonna do it, this is the best way to do it. Um, and no one would publish him, someone finally did. And when he did, 
it was a major breakthrough. And I'll get to that in a second, but to kind of break down his concept a little bit for you, um, first you'll see what he called the O'Neill cylinder. There were many space habitats, space habitats up to this point, but the cylinder was his concept. And you've probably seen that a lot since the sixties. Um, and that was because of him. Um, and so, uh, I kind of want to go over what they are real quick. This is an art piece by a man named Rick, uh, Rick Giddes. He was a NASA artist for a long time. Uh, he actually still is. Um, and we worked with him in the making of the film. Um, but real quick, how it worked. Basically, these would be built at Lagrangian points, as I mentioned, stable gravitational points between the Earth and Moon. They would rotate on their axis to create Earth normal gravity. These mirrors, which you see in the image, which are these orange panels that stick out from the cylinder, they would reflect sunlight. Um, and they'd be also completely controllable um, and you could actually control the weather um, and the length of days, which was very important for not just growing crop, crops, but for, for, um, for many other reasons. Um, the large size created enough scattering to replicate the, replicate, replicate the blue skies of Earth. So we weren't going to be looking at something too dissimilar from Earth. The psychological um, breakthrough wouldn't be too hard for people. Um, they'd be filled with breathable air, um, these end caps are actually agriculture pods. And then you'll actually see the agricultural uh, ring installment that's connected to the ends of them. Those would also be holding crops. And a funny, not a funny, but a very interesting thing that they were talking about at the time is that we could isolate clean embryos. And we, we have been able to for a long time. And they thought, well, maybe we can go up there and we wouldn't even need the cost of, of pesticides because there wouldn't be pests. There wouldn't be... Um, animals that we didn't want to have there. So it was a really unique approach to agriculture as well. And we could grow things um, quite quickly and supply it back to earth. And in the next bullet also hits on that, we'd be getting um, uh, endless solar power, which would be free. Um, these sort of dome shapes you'll see on the, on the ends of each are actually solar power, power panels. And they would face the sun, absorb endless energy, and it would power the station. It would actually be beamed back to earth to create um, uh, via microwaves to, to help power parts of the earth. Over time, it would be enough to actually do some substantial work. Um, um, and that would also, of course, uh, power the agricultural robots. For a fun aspect of it, it would change zero G, I mean, the, the zero G aspects of it and the lower gravitational aspects of it would change sport and activities forever. There's actually been great books and blogs written about this. I'm not, it's, it's really fun. I could go on for hours about it, but I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys links to it instead. Um, but it, 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 there were things as if, you know, we could create half G in certain parts of this, and that would be great for people who are elderly or people who are dealing with injuries or illnesses. And if we could create a low cost way to get there, it would be a great way to extend the lives of humans. Um, the thickness of these, by the way, was enough to um, uh, protect from the cosmic rays of the sun. Um, and the initial ideas were that the land area could house about 10, tens of thousands of people. Um, but now, if you've seen the news recently, which you'll see later in, in this presentation, um, people are talking about tens of millions of people um, because this idea is suddenly very current. Um, and then I think this is sort of fun. This is actually a, a slide from Jerry's original uh, presentation um, about this concept. And you'll see here, so if you're looking at the cylinder sort of like side to side is a long hot dog, this is one end cut away. And he really wanted to build them into something beautiful. He knew it would take time, but he wanted it to ultimately be something relatively wonderful. And the best place parts of earth would, would, would take place in space. And so you'll see there's parks, there's rivers, there's beaches, there's um, uh, human powered flight in the center of this, if you didn't notice. Um, trees, flowers, uh, the, the whole gamut of it. They could use mountain, uh, they could use um, minerals to create mountains on the edges of these, but it would relatively be the most beautiful parts of, of Earth. And his favorite parts of Earth were the Sausalito Bay in California. And you'll see that in a lot of the artistic representations of this concept, that's what they looked like. And you may rec rec uh, recognize some of these if you are familiar with Jerry. Um, and so, but if you don't hear some really wonderful ones, I find this really fascinating too, because the top right is actually one done by the Russian Federation. Um, so this was a worldwide concept. You'll actually see books from Japan talking about this as well. And it just, it, it seems science fiction at the time, but what was so fantastic about it is that it was achievable. 
Um, nothing, well, we'll get to that in a moment, but I do also want to show you guys some fun stuff that didn't make the movie that I hold in my own personal archives. These are Jerry's original drawings and uh, some of his original um, uh, uh, schematics of, and, and, and mathematics about how it would work. Um, this is stuff that didn't make the movie. This is stuff that I found in the Smithsonian that now I own. Um, and then as you'll tell, he's not a good artist. So a lot of this actually got done by other NASA artists, one of which was Don Davis, who is in the movie. Um, and these are his original uh, renditions of the cylinders before they were produced widely. And you've, been, and you've probably seen some of those if, if you're aware of that, but these were the original ones that were um, pretty profound to the, to the public. This was something completely new. Um, so I, next, what I really kind of want to jump into is um, two things. And there, you know, the movie really does the whole gamut of this whole story, but um, what's important to me to tell you guys about today is the how it would be done and the why. Um, I'm personally much more invested in the why because it's everything's still relevant today, but, but the why is very important to me because I can be a part of that. Um, but to, to really kind of just go through the quick how, it's actually relatively simple because there's no new physics that needs to be invented, although, albeit that's not really a phrase that makes much sense, but no real science, no real technology or engineering that needed to be invented. We just needed the cost. We just needed the, fun, the money to, to do it. Um, and part of that was, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, so Earth's gravity is 24 times stronger than that of the moon. And a, a story that Jerry used to use back in the day was that, um, you know, if, if you're going to build a castle on the top of a mountain, why bring the materials up from the base of the mountain? Why not bring it from just around the top of the mountain, and, but be smart about it? Um, and so that's he, what he was sort of applying to space, was saying, why don't we get the materials from the surface of the moon? Let's create uh, 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 lunar mines and whatnot so that we can create, if, if we're gonna do this in a cost efficient way and convince the government, because at the time that was the only entity that could do this, how do we convince them? Let's lower the cost. And so, for example, the, the, the lunar material uh, by weight is roughly 40% aluminum. Um, I think it's something like 5% oxygen. I'm probably getting that wrong, but even just the aluminum aspect of that, you could build almost everything you needed for space colonies and space cylinders with that aluminum. Um, but there's also nitrogen, there's carbon, there's oxygen. So you could create air, you could create water, you could, you know, you could sustain human life in space with the materials on the moon. So to get there, pretty much everything was in place except for one thing, and that was a way to get the um, uh, 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 materials of the moon off into space. Now on Earth, we have to use rockets because they're the only things strong enough um, to get off the surface of the planet. You can't throw materials into space. On the moon, however, we still can't really throw things into space, but machines can. Um, but there wasn't a machine strong enough to do it. So he partnered with a team at MIT who was building the original, <laughs> actually it was one of the first um, practical hyperloop trains for people on, on the surface of the Earth. Um, but uh, this was something they created. It's basically a, a long five foot tube created with um, uh, concurrent uh, electromagnetic rings that would propel material into space. Um, so he basically repurposed their Hyperloop train to, to prove that this was something he could do. And in the movie, we go through all the steps it took to him to get there, but he ultimately achieved it. And so you'll see on the right here, a very sim simple, also this original slide of his as well, um, very simple uh, uh, way of how it would work. So the mass driver would be on the surface of, of, of the moon and it would launch things into orbit and be caught um, and then brought into uh, the Lagrangian points to create um, to uh, create space cylinders. Now, these are also some of his original slides. I think they're just really cool. Obviously his um, cylinders were far, I mean, his, I'm sorry, his uh, presentation was far more complicated than mine is, but this is when he was presenting to people, this is how it worked. And I find it absolutely fascinating that this is how easy it would be to solve this problem um, and, and keep from having to carry things up from the surface of the earth every single time. Um, so that's that sort of answers the how, because yes, there are a million questions about how to build a cylinder in space, about space habitats in space, but 
the missing piece was this was this uh, machine, which he ended up inventing or rather remodifying um, and patenting for uh, for use to do this uh, to have this beautiful vision. So that's the how. I was going to want to talk about the why. Um, so it was Neil Saunders. He was and 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 I highly we'll get to the book in a moment, but um, he he laid out why this was important. Um, and at the time, the Club of Rome argument of, of, you know, the limits to growth on Earth was becoming very popular and it was very relevant. Um, I, I believe it's just as relevant, if not more, today. Um, they were dealing with overpopulation. This would help achieve that. Um, they also, at the time, by the way, only had, I think, 5.5 or 4.5. No, I think it was 5.5 billion people on planet Earth. Now we have eight. Um, I don't. Well, doesn't matter. Um, hunger was an issue by building space, uh, by building um, resources in space. We could also build ways to feed people from space because these these colonies would relatively be self replicatable, um, uh, and they would grow and grow in size. And that means that that would their, their uh, the energy and the resources they would send back to Earth would grow and grow. Um, it was also a, a way to deal with dwindling resources. And I'm really talking about energy here um, and climate change, of course, because you know uh, uh, if we can't uh, fix that problem, then at least there is some sort of backup plan, but there is a way to, and, and Jerry used to say this a lot, that he wanted to put people and infrastructure and, and, and the creation of energy into space so that the earth could in a way uh, uh, revive itself to reheal, um, so that we could really treat Earth like just almost like a, a national park in a way. Um, and these all sort of whittled down back to war. Um, and uh, he, he, like everybody else during that time, was aware that war could be the end of humanity. And he said, "Why not solve these problems so that even if we do hit that limit to growth, at least we're not going to be." Um, you know, forced into war. Um, and if we are, at least we have a backup plan. So um, he was frequently uh, quoted as saying, opening the high frontier means making possible and ensuring the survival of the human race. And that sort of just encapsulates everything that I just said. So kind of, we can move on here. Um, so he realized this idea was uh, taking on some, some traction. So he actually called together some, uh, major NASA people, major press people, and scientists and astronauts, and all of these people from around the world to come together and just discuss them um, and, and, and use the scientific method to prove that either this is a good idea for the government to do, or this is wrong. And these were called the Space Manufacturing Conferences. They took place at Princeton University. These are actual drawings by Don Davis, who did almost all the drawings of these cylinders because uh, he was he was the only artist uh, sitting there that day. Um, and one other really important who, person who was sitting there that day was um, uh, a reporter for the New York Times. And lo and behold, a few days later, January 18th, 1976, he's on the front cover of the New York Times in likely the most expensive black ink covered uh, New York Times you'll ever see. But this was a moment where he went from being someone with a pretty cool idea to a national icon. Um, his widow actually says, I think the quote is something to the effect of, it changed, uh, it was crazy. It changed our lives overnight. We had to change our phone number. It was crazy. Um, and that's exactly what happened. People realized that this concept was enormous and that by going out there and doing that and creating energy and, 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 and resources in space, we could do this, and it was hope for the future. And a man named John Rockman, if you haven't heard of him, he was a major uh, publisher on the East Coast at the time. He convinced him to take all these things in together and write a book. So he wrote The High Frontier. This book I could go on for hours about, but I think to encapsulate it, um, there's a man in the movie who's, who's quoted in saying, um, you can read the book. It will change the way you think about space forever. Um, and honestly, I think I'll leave it at that because uh, this book changed the culture of space. It changed the space industry and it changed the lives of thousands of people, um, including everyone in our movie, included some of the most uh, famous people you know of, 
Um, and the leaders of the modern day new space movement, people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, um, these people all attribute their full life inspiration to not just Jerry O'Neill, but to this book. And so if you can imagine how that's affected people over time, you can imagine what it was like at that time. So he was on every major TV show. He was on Johnny Carson, you can see there, PBS Nova. He, this is Isaac Asimov on the top right. He was on um, In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. He was on Larry King's radio show. He was on everything at the time. Um, but not just that, he was at every major conference because he was not just a worker on this. He was an activist. He worked endlessly with grassroots campaigns. He worked with the government. He was on the National Commission on Space under Ronald Reagan. Um, he gave talks all around the world at universities um, and on news channels and other languages even. Um, but, uh, and, and that really propelled him in a way that someone who just wrote a book and said no one showed up did. He, he, he made this case and said, I'm going to achieve it. I'm going to prove that we can achieve it. And one thing he did was uh, he founded the Space Studies, Studies Institute with his uh, wife, Tasha. And it was really to bring the masses of people who now looked up to him uh, to work on this together. And he believed that if this was going to get done, the people were going to have to get the government to do it um, or do it themselves. Um, so this is sort of where the story explodes. And I think that, you know, I won't do it justice. And the best thing I can do here is kind of entice you to watch the movie. Um, so I'm going to quickly show our trailer for the movie. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy that. We are on a very fragile planet at the present time. These are the most dangerous decades in all of human history. We have the capability to destroy ourselves and yet we have not broken free of the limitations of that thin biosphere of the Earth. Now, some serious scientists are talking about whole colonies in space. Not on the Moon, Mars, or Jupiter, but on man-made planets. And populated not by scientists and astronauts alone, but by hundreds of thousands of just plain folks looking to get away from an overcrowded Earth, running short of energy, water, and clean air. The human race must leave and occupy other places in space. Do you really believe we can be there soon? With the technology that we have now, we could do it and maybe by the late 1980s. Talking about outer space and colonizing outer space is always intriguing. And here's a gentleman who knows about it. Would you welcome please, Gerard K. O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill rolls out this book called The High Frontier that shows how to do it step by step. And it's go time. Anyone can read the book that will change how you think about space forever. It's possible to make uh, habitats which are relatively big, big enough to be very Earth-like. 90% of the people on Earth in 100 years would move out into space and leave the Earth. We call the Earth the old country. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry O'Neill asked, is a planetary surface the right place for an expanding industrial civilization? The episode of human life being confined to Earth is coming to an end. Space will be the next civilization. Industries and colonies in space may sound incredible, but we who are working toward them know that most of the building blocks are already in place. Jerry O'Neill is a physicist with a brilliant reputation among his colleagues. O'Neill might have stayed in that abstract world, but he has always been intrigued by space. Jerry had a dream of going into space and he went through the whole program, all the rigorous, grueling uh, physical and psychological tests. I was really worried that O'Neill's influence and his greatness has not been publicly understood. But then if somebody with the wherewithal of Jeff Bezos actually tries to implement it, that's transformational. And it's this generation's job to build that road to space. Professor O'Neill was very formative for me. I read The High Frontier in high school, and as soon as I read it, it made sense to me. Space isn't just something that's just the engineers show up to. You know, this is something for, for artists and, and writers and business people. We were a bunch of young, intuitive punks. We're all Jerry's kids. We're all, in one way or another, caught up in this idea. Three, two, one, zero. Yes, it was crazy. Yes, it was science fiction. Yes, it was way out there. 
but the steps were there. It just was hard work. And all of us were willing to do the hard work. We, you and I, are the only people who will ever have the privilege of saying, we explored the solar system first. This concept is so enormous in its scale and the change of human events that's gonna happen inevitably as a result of this. It's very important that it be about everybody, that we stay true to Jerry's vision. We're all Jerry's kids, and that's something to be excited by and a legacy that we can all live into. Life is extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily precious. Opening the high frontier means making possible and ensuring the survival of the human race. Okay, great. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, so real quick, just about our team in the making of this movie, um, just to sort of switch gears a little bit. Um, this movie was um, originated by our executive producer and writer, uh, Dylan Taylor, who's here on the top left. Um, he is, if you haven't heard of him, he is one of the major space investors in the new space community. Um, he's a major part of what's going on now with companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, Virgin Galactic, and all the other Axiom Space and all these other guys. Um, he is the president of the largest space holding company, Voyager Space Holdings. Um, he's also the president of, of the company I work for, which is Multiverse Media. Um, he actually uh, was talking to a man named Rick Tumlinson. If you don't know him, he was, uh, he was in the trailer. He had the cool, really big cool ring. Um, they were talking about how Jerry didn't have much uh, credit. He didn't get much credit in the recent advances that companies like SpaceX were getting in, in around the 2010s to 2015s. And he said, you know what, someone needs to make a movie about this guy. He went out, tried to make a movie for about two months, realized he wasn't a filmmaker. Uh, and then uh, he found me and I came on and uh, for about two years, two and a half years, spent, uh, spent that entire time researching, traveling around the world. And um, uh, it was an incredible journey because uh, people were lining up to be in this movie. Um, people who you never would have thought that would want to be a part of something like this, like including Jeff Bezos and Peter Diamandis of the X Prize, they dropped everything they were doing to be a part of this. Um, and so it was a really wonderful experience for me. Um, we then, uh, towards the end of production, partnered with Subtractive Inc, who is in, if you're from California, they are in Santa Monica. They're an awesome space media company. Um, and they are uh, run by our producer and then the guy who was um, our accredited director and editor, Ryan Stite, um, on the bottom there. So I kind of just want to go through a quick few little highlights of the making of the movie, too, if I haven't already caught you to, to, to maybe catch you a little bit more, which is that, so we have thousands of hours of archive footage, which was obtained from over 100 private and public sources. This was friends, families, universities, museums, film studios, and I literally pulled things out of the trash. Um, to, to make this movie. Over a thousand magazine and books were reviewed page by page for mentions of O'Neill whenever we got a tip. Um, we bought old tape decks and out of commission video devices to hunt for gems that might be out there. Hundreds of hours of radio talk shows, speeches, and uh, news recordings were listened in, to and digitized, all with a major uh, cost behind them. Um, almost a thousand beyond repair slides were cleaned and digitized. Um, we digitized artwork from Don Davis, Rick Giddis, Robert McCall, Ron Miller, P Pat Rawlings, and more, and animated their work. Now, this is a really big one, too, because um, artists don't typically allow you to do that. That's kind of like, if you can ever get a contract with an artist to use their work, they never let you alter it. But they, like I said, people got their careers because of this man, and no one knows of him. And because of that, they allowed us to do pretty much whatever we wanted with their with their content. Um, then we also commissioned two well-known 3D artists to create fly-through animations of being in an O'Neill cylinder, which I think my biggest regret of at least not having met Jerry in my life is that I wish he could have seen those because they were really incredible. Um, and then just real quick about my personal journey, um, I found out a month into production that I was Tasha O'Neill, Jerry's widow. Uh, I was her, widow, her uh, neighbor for 15 years in Princeton when I was a kid. And um, it was a really weird 
circumstance when I had found that out. Um, and it really sort of changed the um, carbonation of this film turning into something fantastic because um, uh, it allowed, it gave her a little bit more of a, tr a trust with us to allow us to go into her archives and to find more and more, but even more. I, and I've written an article online that I can, I can share about how Jerry and I lived almost identical lives, just roughly 60 years apart. Um, and we, we used to walk the same routes in Princeton every day. I used to go through his office every single day. Uh, we used to fish at the same spots. We used to canoe at the same spots. And it's just this really weird cosmic moment. Um, the other fantastic thing was that when we approached the O'Neills, the, 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 um, the remaining family, they all said that they did not want to be a part of the film. They were just too nervous about it. Um, and over the course of creating this film, they all changed their minds because they realized what a wonderful piece this was going to be. And uh, just before the pandemic, we got them all back together for a reunion, which is in the movie, which is really special. And I think just a, a last thought here, too, is that I, I'm of a younger generation who did not live through the Apollo era. I, I, I think it's a, a testament to Jerry's vision that he bridged that gap and inspired someone who was not born a space kid. I was I was an athlete. I was a, a film nerd um, and, and spreading his vision of a more beneficial and hopeful future is something that still holds water today. Um, if he was here, he'd be able to convince anyone about that, but unfortunately he is not. And I hope that this film will do a little bit of legwork for him. Um, I think in, in closing here, Jerry's greatest achievement, in my opinion, is what's called his Jerry's Kids. Um, and these are people, and if you see the film, it was actually the original title of the film because everyone I've talked about who's gone on to create a, a career out of, um, uh, out of how whatever they felt was appropriate, whether it be business or science or art, they all did it because of Jerry and they all have now, after they've built a little bit of a capsule for themselves, are using their power to now build that O'Neill world that he envisioned so long ago. And they all call themselves Jerry's kids. And I think it's a really, it is the most powerful thing that has come out of this. And um, I think without, without them, this story would have just been, uh, you know, lost. Um, and so, um, the next thing I'm going to show you is something I didn't tell anyone about. Um, I thought that this would be really, if I haven't inspired you enough, I think you should hear from the man himself. Um, this is actually the first minute and a half, I think, of the film. Um, and uh, it also includes some of the really wonderful animations we made for the film. So I'd, I'd love to show that real quick. It's quite short. Earthlings have always been an adventuring people. We've always looked to a frontier to give us new opportunity, free reign to our sense of enterprise. The frontier enriched us, generating new wealth, but it also gave us new ideas, new institutions, and new ways of living. Today, the colonization of space offers us a new, limitless frontier. It's bountiful, it's friendly, and it's waiting for us. I mean Earth-like habitats, complete with grass and trees and flowers. Habitats that can be built within the limits of existing technology. So if you enjoyed that, if you've enjoyed what I've been saying, this movie is now available on Apple TV. It's on Fandango, Voodoo, Google Play, uh, Microsoft Stream. It will be on Amazon 
Um, but if you are aware of what's going on with Amazon at the moment, they've actually blocked all new documentaries, but the moment that block is down, you will find us on there and it'll be uh, on Amazon Prime so you can watch it at a much more discounted, if not free price. Um, but Apple TV is the best place to find it. I know some of the people here have already seen it there, so I'm, thank you. Um, in addition to that, like I mentioned earlier, we did release two books along with the movie. Um, for one, on the left here is actually the original, The High Frontier is the third edition. Um, this is the special movie edition of it. Um, uh, in the back is actually a DVD that includes some of the last on-camera appearances Jerry made because he knew he was dying. Um, and he decided to make two videos about what it meant to be a part of the human space program and about how to go out there and make this happen. Um, it's really beautiful stuff. And, and not only that, like I said, read the book, it will change how you think about space forever. Um, and then uh, the Humanizing Space book on the right here, The Humanizing Space, uh, The Life of Gerard O'Neill. This is actually written by our executive producer, Dylan Taylor. This is the full life story of Jerry. Um, obviously the High Frontier era is the most fun but there's a lot more to his story. He was uh, almost killed in war. He was a newscaster in a small town in New York, in, in New York State. He uh, had a, a marriage before Tasha with an entire family before, before then. Um, and he dealt with a lot of other things and it goes on through his illness and death. Um, it's a really beautiful story and I highly recommend it. Um, if you can, please go for, I'll, I'll leave links later, but here's highfrontiermerch.com. That's where you can find it. And if you do buy it, please leave us a review. And to, in, in addition to that, if you're not a book person and you're a clothing person, we have awesome merch for the movie, um, including posters and all that sort of stuff. We also have some of the books and uh, audio books on there as well. Um, I have all of it. I can attest to it actually being great clothing. So if that's your concern, don't worry about it. Um, and then for you guys, I have free shipping. I just use the promo code High Frontier No Spaces. Um, and uh, uh, please, if you, if, if you do get that, share, share with me as well. I'd love to see it. Um, and then in closing, here's some links for the for our uh, for our, for our, st our movie, um, the highfrontiermovie.com. You can find where to watch, uh, more about the story, the trailer, and our merch on there, the highfrontiermerch.com as well. Um, and then we are currently like one of the most active documentaries on social media, apparently. Um, and so you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at highfrontierdoc. Um, and that is my last slide. I really enjoyed sharing that with you all. And I hope that if, even if this is not your cup of tea, I hope I inspired you in some way. Um, and secondly, being an astronomy club, I, I, this is one of the small markets of people I didn't get to speak about, uh, this concept with, because I know this is a very, um, potentially volatile issue too, because building things in space like this, the SpaceX Starlink. Um, has become an issue. So I'd love to hear what people have to say, but that is the end. I'll stop sharing your screen and come back and see y'all. Okay. Will, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Uh, I did see the entire documentary, extremely impressed by that. What I liked most about this, and we've spoken about this before, is the way it's put together. There is no narrator. The footage, you did thousands of hours of research, and you put it together beautifully in such a way that there was no need for a narrator. But there's more to that story. Would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, well, and yeah, as I mentioned, is that, uh, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> um, we, it was a little bit of a friendly argument at the beginning of making this film, which was that a lot of people wanted to have a narrator, um, primarily because we had, like I said, so many people lining up to be a part of this project. And, and, and we had people who wanted to be the narrator of the movie. Um, uh, and, and we had to ultimately realize that it just wasn't right for the movie because there was so much content and we could have made a nine hour movie but we had to stick to a standard 90 minutes or we would lose people because it's a science documentary. We didn't want to lose people. And we knew that we could tell it just by being smart storytellers. Um, and I ended up writing the entire film um, myself and, and, and doing the entire story production in the edit room. So I'm very proud of that. Thank you for acknowledging that, that was a hard thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it, absolutely. Uh, being the documentaries are my preferred genre. And I've only seen a few done that way. There, it, you did an exquisite job. Now, there's more I want to say. However, 
Uh, there are other people, I think, in line. First, I'd like to ask Reza, has anybody in the chat room posed any questions for Will Henry? Um, not yet, but let's uh, do a call. Uh, the Q&A and the chat are open. If you have any questions, please do write them in uh, Q&A. Uh, so back to you, Keith, if you have more questions with the panelists. Actually, I'd like to uh, talk to Todd. Todd, you have, you've started on the book and you've seen the documentary also. Yeah, tell us what you know about the book so far. Give us your impressions. Unmute and... Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so far it's it's a it's a blueprint. It, it's 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 laid out. Um, Doctor O'Neill had had a, a plan, <laughs> and it's right here. Um, uh, I've actually gone on to the uh, the Space Studies Institute website and uh, was looking at at some recent talks they've done, and it, it's it's fascinating there's there's progress they're 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 staying on top of nasa and they're not relying on anybody they're just they're moving forward um with dr o'neill's uh, ideas and uh it, it's 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 wonderful stuff yeah i'm glad that you said it was a uh, blueprint ironically is the word that so many people use um uh, and a lot of people are afraid to use that term sometimes because time changes. Um, but it really was a blueprint for, for the future. What's wild to me is that you read that now and it does not age. Um, it, it's the same science. You can do it the way it's written in there now today. What, what, I, what I thought was amusing was in, in uh, 1976, there they were, he was talking about, you know, people in Oregon and Idaho being annoyed with Californians leaving because of the, you know, it was overpopulated and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was, nothing's changed there. No. It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. You, it does, it, it, you hit on something too there, which was that in his later, in Jerry's later life, in his, uh, in, in like the, the 80s, he, um, he wrote a book called 2081, which was, he wrote it and released it in 1981. So I guess he wrote it in the late seventies actually. Um, but it was a prediction of where we would be along the way throughout the next hundred years. Um, and it's really eerie because I read it three years ago. Um, everything he predicted was either spot on. He predicted today's uh, 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 population of the earth. I, to the to the exact amount, um, and he, he predicted uh, self driving cars, how the way credit cards would work, the way libraries and computers would work, um, and the only thing he got slightly off is the fact that we don't have O'Neill cylinders yet. But it was his idea, so why wouldn't he say it would happen? <laughs> okay. Wow. All right, now David. I know that you and I go back as far as uh, the Apollo era. Uh, one of the lines that came out and stuck with me from the documentary, and it's in the trailer, is that we, not you will, but me, I am part of the first generation to explore the solar system. I, my memory goes back as far as the Gemini project and David, I know you probably go back that far too. You want to uh, chime in on um, on uh, the history that we've experienced, David? Unmute, please. How about that? That's great. Okay, great. Uh, that also grabbed me when that, you know, in that terminology. Because we are we are the first generation to explore space, but my question is, I don't know if the book is written this way. I yet to read it, but does it talk about how do we take other creatures with us, or do we just become human beings on this planet without other creatures? And the other one is, how do we protect this environment out there? you know, like do some sort of force field or whatever. Yeah. I, 
So those things, I don't know if it's in the book or not. Yeah, well, it definitely is. And he, he will say it far more eloquently than I will. Um, and, um, but he does answer both of those questions, but to, to sort of just answer, um, well, first, the first one, um, uh, as far as creatures and animals, uh, the idea would be to bring the um, animals that we, we felt fit um, it, it would be it would be a, a scale. Obviously, we would not go up there with bears immediately. <laughs> um, but we would we would over time acclimate animals if we felt like they were acclimating to space correctly and 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 it was beneficial to them. Then yeah, we would we would grow with them in space. I think what he made quite um, public was that he didn't want to have to worry about pesticides. He wanted to keep certain um, pests to a minimum. And by doing that, we would start off with clean embryos because an embryo, it doesn't have any issues. You, you grow it and then it creates issue, issues um, and its species creates issues. And so what we would want to do is go up there with the embryos of the animals we wanted to start with, see how far we got with that and then grow and grow and grow. But the idea was never to leave any of that behind unless, unless nature made us. And I can, I can absolutely guarantee that Mother Nature would have said, "No, you can't bring whales." <laughs> something, something would not have worked out, and it would have been that's you can only have whales on Earth, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, exactly. uh, and then I guess your your second question. There's sort of a few answers to that, but can I can I clarify? Do you mean um, would there be a way for us to protect ourselves in space, or a way not oh, to you know the village space? Uh, there's micro meteors in space that do penetrate. Uh, even the, the astronaut suits are built so they won't penetrate. Uh, how would this be protected? Does he yeah. mention that? He does actually. Um, and and, and it's, it's not the answer I think people would wanna hear, which is that, um, uh, first of all, at the, the one good side of this is that in, in Lagrangian points, in the, the, the places we were looking, there's no space junk. So the things that we deal with in um, uh, with our satellites and with places like the ISS, um, in fact, the ISS was just hit with something like like a like a ping pong ball, like a, a week ago, and it went straight through a solar panel. And I can only imagine what that would have done if it was a, a, a part of the um, the, hab the the habitation parts of, of the ISS. Now, I think that they uh, were able to, they knew it was coming. So they were able to either ward off of it or know that it was only gonna hit a solar panel, who cares? Um, now, meteors are not as predictable. Meteorites, little bits of rocks and, and whatnot in space, you can track that, um, but you can't move a massive million ton O'Neill cylinder quickly, you can't. Um, and so there would be issues. That said, um, the images that I share, the, the artwork that you've probably seen, it doesn't do it justice to show just how thick the thing is. And so the main complaint was actually cosmic rays, the, the radiation from the sun. Um, and so he proved that there would be almost no radiation and in, in, in fact, it would actually be less than what we have here on the earth. Um, but as far as you know, rocks and meteorites and all that sort of stuff or, or, or space junk that goes awry, um, that sort of stuff, um, we would, they would be built thick enough that the, there would not be a problem. And even the window areas, um, it would take a really skilled meteorite to come through the solar panel and hit the, hit the windows. Um, and in that case, he was hoping there would be enough that we'd convince humanity that it's worth it. That if one of 4,000 of them were to get hit, that we'd say, okay, at least we're getting enough energy out of this. It's a tragedy, but you know, it, it, it's not that it would not be an everyday issue that I think that people would have to worry about, which is, I think the, the better point. Okay. Thank you. All right. Very good. Very good. I had a, I had a question actually. Yeah. Um, so I, in your, in your talk, you, you were saying in, he came up with the idea of the O'Neill cylinder in the 60s yeah so, so like was, like 70, 71 maybe oh okay i was i was wondering which came first uh, rendezvous with rama or <laughs> the o'neill cylinder yeah well it's funny yeah so rendezvous with rama is the closest 
I can find for this. Um, now, I think Rendezvous with Rama, I think it might have been before. But as far as I understand it, Rendezvous with Rama was not um, a, like any sort of scientific proposal. Um, it did take the same shape, I believe. Um, so I, I don't remember which, and I can look it up real quick, but I don't remember which came first. I think it might have been Rendezvous with Rama. Hmm. One of the things that I wanted to point out, Will, is that as I was watching your documentary. It was uh, after. Ah, very it was good, after. very good, very good, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have, we've had speakers at Ventura County Astronomical Society recently talking about uh, Tabitha Star and the uh, Dyson Sphere. And your documentary has the last known interview with Dr. Dyson before he passed away. Did you do the interview with him yourself? I did, yeah. yeah How did. was that? It's a weird, a really weird and uh, um, emotional in a way that I'm not going to get emotional, but it was emotional for me because it was, one, it was just, one, it was my first interview on the movie. It was the first thing, first um, uh, uh, subject that I spoke to. Um, and so, and when I did my research for this, I did it like a, 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 a true re researcher would have done it, which is I read everything they ever wrote. I did everything they ever did. I went through everything. Um, and he was the only person I never made it through everything because it was Freeman Dyson. Um, <laughs> but was, what was so fantastic is that like, yes, it was his, it, that was his last interview on camera ever. Um, and it was a beautiful experience too, because I was back in my hometown, Princeton, and we were, inter I was interviewing him in a room that looked out, his window looked out a pond that I used to fish at every summer growing up and never <laughs> knew that that window was his office. And then I would come back 15 years later and interview the guy um, on this. And I mean, talk about, talk about nervous. I mean, He's like the Einstein of today, or rather was the Einstein of today. And, and, and I, I'm amazed I didn't lose my mind talking to him because I, I, I'm an intelligent person, but I am not an Einstein. <laughs> he, he is an Einstein. And speaking to him was amazing. What's funny is I asked him about the Dyson Sphere. Um, and I asked him what relationship it has to the O'Neill Cylinder. And it's funny, you'll, you may laugh at his uh, response, which was that, oh, I, I never meant it that way. It was just a <laughs> joke. Um, it was something that I, it was just like, well, you could do this. Um, Cause he was, he was a, like a, sort of a hard cutting guy. You know, he, he, he didn't mess around. He was 94 when I interviewed him um, and he, he, he cut my chops and he, he was like the, the idea of a Dyson sphere has gone so far beyond what I ever imagined. It was not what I actually intended at the outset. And he was just talking about a concept, like conversely in a conversation that could potentially create its own energy. And someone called it a Dyson Sphere and that's history. And it took on its own life and that's what we live with today, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, well you were really privileged to have that time with him. And yeah. as you said earlier in the beginning, how you uh, lived a parallel life 60 years apart, wow. What a, what a great experience for you. Now, let's go on to your next project. Uh, you're doing something for NASA, an eight-part series about the overview effect. And I do know a little bit about the overview effect, but tell us in the audience, what is it that you're working on? Yeah, so the overview effect, if you don't know about it, is um, it's something that has existed since people started going to space, but it was coined by a, a man named Frank White. Um, and the overview effect is the cognitive shift that um, currently astronauts have when they go to space and look back at Earth. Um, and it, it, it's the sense of wholeness, it's the, self, uh, the, the, the sense of oneness with people. And most importantly, it's the sense of, well, well, there's two important parts, which is the one, we are an insanely fragile planet. The atmosphere is this tiny little thing that happens to be on the edge. It's like the color on a gumball. 
you know, and it's so small and we are so fragile. Um, and uh, 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 two is that astronauts go to, 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 to space and they look back and they expect to see borders. They expect to see borders between African nations. They expect to see borders in Europe, in Russia, in America. They're not there. They're not there at all. In fact, it all looks like this one colorful, beautiful marble. Um, and it changes them in a way that I can't even do justice, but it, it changes them in a way that um, is profound enough that when they come back, it's one of their main priorities is to prove to people that this is important, that you need to go out there and see this. Because if you see this, you'll care about other people. War will, will subside. We will stop being such a selfish um, uh, race of, of people. And, and we will find a way to, to, to build a future for humanity. And so a lot of companies are looking to create that experience for people by taking people up into, there's a new company that's doing like these balloon launches that take people far enough and then they pull them right back. Um, Virgin Galactic is doing that for, for, for private citizens. Um, Space for Humanity is already building their roster of, pe a roster of people to go do that. Um, and then uh, even people uh, for SpaceX, I mean, even the most recent, these are not government officials. These are not military people. These are average citizens with great IQs who have found their way to, to be able to go, um, but, but almost entirely for the purpose of, of, of um, having that experience. And so what that means, though, is one, you can know about the over experience. And the two is you can have it. Um, and the first part is getting people to, to know about it. And so a lot of people are trying to just spread that word. Um, I talk to Frank on a daily basis about how we can actually do that. Um, and then uh, uh, two is, is, is content like the media we're putting together now with NASA. Um, and um, NASA, if you don't know, works with nobody. They work with absolutely nobody. Um, you have to know how to, to go into the right channels and then say the right thing. Um, and I had to learn to do that on the high frontier. Um, and we realized there was an option to make a, a, a documentary out of um, footage that had already been shot talking to astronauts that is living in an archive right now that has not been produced into anything and to turn that into an eight-part series talking about why this is important. That would be fantastic, Will. Do you have a, a release date? No, no, I probably wish I did. <laughs> okay, but it's currently in development. Yeah, I'd say a year. I'd say a year, year and a half. Okay, it's, it'll be worth the wait. That is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, any other projects going on or is that the main one that you've got? So we're doing that. We're also doing like sort of a mini documentary about the overview effect separately. Um, I'm also separately personally and uh, with the funding from Multiverse working on a documentary about um, how radiation works and how the perception of, uh, of radiation, like the actual um, physics of radiation is entirely um, uh, misperceived in, 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 in public. Um, my father was a, 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 an ex-spy, also one of the leading radiation uh, chemists in the world, and he taught me at a very young age that what you're going to learn about radiation is wrong, and understanding the real radiation may solve energy crises. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, and now I get it. So we're really sort of diving into that and talking to some of the most wonderful scientists right now to sort of learn more about that. I'm looking forward to that too. It was, sounds to me like uh, it's time for you to take a trip in space. <laughs> yes. I well, mean, it's funny. there's a, there's a program I work with that's picking citizen astronauts and I, they're like, you should apply. And I was like, eh. yeah, what I, what I see here, what I gather from this, and I think I'll make this my last remark for tonight and uh, open it up for everybody else. And that is, is that right now, the documentary is perfectly timed. It's right on time. A lot of people have opened up space tourism. Now it's expensive to get up there and it seems kind of exclusionary, but that is a necessary first step. And that's the way it's always been. It was the rich people that did the exploration first. And then as the uh, tourism developed, it became an industry. Um, Gerard O'Neill, Dr. O'Neill's um, space habitats may have actually been ahead of time. It seems that this space tourism, 
space tourism industry has to come first to get people excited about visiting space before you can convince them to actually start living there. And that's what I want to leave tonight. I, I think it's a, what you've done is a uh, it's great. And anybody else want to uh, make a comment? Reza, do we have any questions? Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, so, Will, that was a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And so we do have a couple of questions about the uh, process of making a documentary. So first of all, you did mention that it took a lot of effort utilizing all the uh, footage available worldwide. And that was uh, like a tremendous work. And then uh, you have to go through these footage uh, every perhaps frame by frame to choose and then cut and then do that. So for the ignorant among us, can you explain more what this process involves? How many hours you have to put this? You mentioned you did that personally. Uh, so can you tell us more about how you make this? Do you have a storyline first and then you match the footage or is it the other way? You look at the footage and the story comes out to you. Um, so it's more the second. Um, however, we did both in a sense, and, and we started with your your first uh, started with your first example, which was that we we had a script which was really more of a beat sheet, but said we know Jerry's life is history. We can write it down, um, and we now need to go out there and see who's going to show up, um, and 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 then hear what they have to say. And I'm telling you this, we did like fifty some odd interviews at least at the beginning. And every interview we were like, I didn't know that. And so we'd have to go and spend an entire month researching that and figuring out how to get the access to that. Cause like we found out randomly that at the Smithsonian there's uh, I think it was 52 boxes of his personal effects. We didn't know that. And then when we found that we said, well, we gotta go, we gotta go and get that. And so then we had to talk to the Smithsonian and basically argue, not argue with them but I had to go in and put on my big smiley face and say, how can I convince you to let me look at that? I'm friends with the widow. How can we make this happen? And then we did it. And then I go there and spend four days in, an, in, a, in a back corner in a lab, going through everything, taking photos of everything, bringing it back to California and then saying, okay, how do we use this? Um, that was really just like one of the ways. Um, one of the things we did too was we uh, had to, we found tons and tons and tons of old tape, um, videotape and audio tape in the, his, his basement. Um, we had no idea what was on it. We had to search for weeks to find someone who knew what this content was made of, um, if it was salvageable. Um, I think I lost race, but if this was salvageable, um, and 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 then it was just a matter of paying to get it done. And it was very expensive in a lot of these cases because these things are out of commission. I mean, you you wouldn't imagine what it costs to just transfer an old beta tape. Um, and so, uh, over time, it's just, it was, it was years of sifting through what felt like trash to finally find these little bits of piece, little bits of, of history, um, and, and hoping that it fits somewhere. And then it was just, I mean, it was a match made in heaven where we just sat down and said, how do we put together this perfect mosaic of, of content? Um, and we could cut the movie nine different ways. I promise you it, it, it took <laughs> And a lot of it still lives in that corner right there in that office and in, in that other room. It, there's my entire storage room is just Jerry O'Neill artifacts at the moment until I can get it physically archived on another planet. So I know it's not going to burn up. <laughs> <laughs> Reza, we lost you for a moment there. Uh, everything OK? Yes, I'm back here. Thank you. And that that that's yes. Great. Thanks for the extra. Uh, information here. Now, uh, there's also some questions about your personal connection. You do uh, make some points about that. And uh, what would it take for the producer and the other stuff to convince you to go into this movie? Can you tell us more about uh, how you switched gear into space? Yeah, um, and it's really a, a wild, it was completely random. If I'm being completely honest with you, it was completely random. Um, I uh, uh, was off another project and I was looking for the next project to work on something relatively big. 
Um, and uh, my contact info came across Dylan Taylor's desk at the exact right moment. Um, and I, he emailed me and I, I, I said, he, I asked what he was working on. Um, and it was one of those things, I mean, when, when, <laughs> when someone tells you that they're doing a documentary about a Princeton professor, a scientist um, who lived here and here and did this and this, and you were raised in Princeton, on Princeton University, by a chemist who did this and this in the same fields, who lived in the same buildings and all this stuff. I said, you know what? I think there's a really weird cosmic thing going on here. Um, I may know a lot about what you're working on and may have a lot of direct connections. And I may not have been some profound, profoundly successful filmmaker when I started this film, but I knew everybody in Princeton. And if that, if he didn't take the chance on me to do that he never would have gotten half the stuff that's in the movie um and i never would have had the chance to um have the uh uh the backbone of his production company to be able to say hey we can pay for it too you know so it was a it was sort of a match made in heaven and it was a complete roll of the dice on his part um and uh i'm forever thankful for it because it, it honestly changed my life i was not a space person at all I love space. Who doesn't love space? But I'm more of like a, a natural, organic, bi uh, like biology sciences kind of guy. Um, and and he uh, once he brought me on. And the fun fact about this is that I wasn't brought on as the producer or writer. I was brought on as a uh, producer's assistant to help him do paperwork. He just got really busy. And I said, I'm obsessed with this story. I am absolutely fascinated by what's going on here. Um, and I know how to make a movie and I, all due respect, I don't know if you know how to make a movie. And so it just like was this a major switch of power. And I was like, I'm going to make this movie. And that's what ended up happening. Wow. So you started out as walking down the yellow brick road and you came home banging a tambourine. You're, <laughs> a, you're, you're a convert. Well, pretty much. Yeah. You're, you're one of Jerry's kids too. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I, I would say maybe a Jerry's grandkid, but definitely. Okay. Definitely, yeah, definitely in the family. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, we can't just say we've gone to the moon and then stop, say, okay, we're done. We've got to move forward. And yeah. the people that were involved with getting us to the moon, for the most part, they're gone now. But the impetus isn't gone because you said we have just Bezos, uh, uh, other people that are just so much devoted to bringing people. And I said this before, I was said I was gonna close, but the reality is, is that yes, it's expensive. Uh, but what Jerry was telling us is that space isn't just for the rich, it's for everyone. And this is where we need to go. Yeah. And if I, if I can just add one more little bit to that is that, um, and I didn't mention this in my presentation, but it's very, very, very important, which is that a lot of people have a lot of animosity towards people in the space industry for a good reason, um, but they are not doing what they're doing to leave Earth. They're doing what they're doing to help Earth. Um, we know that the Apollo project, Apollo project gave us better calculators to teach students better and all around the world. If we didn't have the Apollo project, we would not have the advances that we have today. We know that going to space will help Earth. And um, it, I think it's far more profound than the Apollo project um, and it will only grow. Um, and and, and, and I, I, they all say it, the reason we're going is to help Earth, not the other way around. That's a great point. That is a great point. Uh, Reza, Tara, Excellent. David. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, no other uh, questions from the audience. Uh, do the panelists have any other comments or remarks? Was, was anyone else worried when, uh, when that, uh, the lunar regolith was flying toward L2 and thinking about the James Webb Space Telescope big right there? Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, and so that, that really begs the question. I mean, well, what I didn't really dive into is just how many he envisioned being out there um, and how big they would be, but just how small they would be in reality. Um, and uh, he really wanted people to, you know, experiment with 
new ways of being. You know, he was like, if, if you want an entire, you call it colony, but the new terms are really uh, habitat or community or, or, or the space migration to sort of push away the whole like the Westerner coming to America sort of perception um, uh, uh, was that he really wanted, if people wanted to have an entire col- uh, cylinder for uh, people who love classical music, that they could do that. He was going this, down this fantastically romantic vision that the end game would have allowed millions and millions and millions of these cylinders to exist. Um, and, and although he answered a lot of questions like the radiation and, 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 and the, how to track meteorites, it would happen. It, a practical scientist knows that it would happen um, and disasters would happen. Um, then he'd also probably say disasters happen on earth too. So right. it's really just how do you grow financially responsibly and quick enough to not deter yourself from turning back. Um, and I think uh, he realized financially we could con- convince American government to do it and they almost funded it. Um, there's really one guy who, who, who stopped it. Um, and uh, I'm curious what, what the next 20 years, I think it will take, personally, I think it will take a century until we see these things actually take place. Um, I, I hope it's sooner, but I, I, I know it will take time. Um, but I would love to see what, what ends up happening and what other things are out there too, because I'm not against landing on Mars and creating a, a civilization there too. You know, I, to me, it's all of them. Uh, I think we, a very, we have to get out there. Yeah. yeah. I also think a very important step is happening very soon. And that is Tom Cruise is filming <laughs> on the International Space Station. And that goes way beyond space tourism. Okay. Yeah. That is the, not just the commercialization of space, that now space has become the entertainment industry or a part of it. And yeah. that will just catapult us into the future even faster. And the reason for that is because the cost has gone down 100%. Uh-huh. And as you were saying earlier, people were going to space because they were super um, 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 rich individuals. I, I mean, I remember uh, Gary Olison going or Greg Olson going in like 2004, but he, it was like $40 million or something for one guy to go for four days. And it was like not very profound for the world, but for him, it was fantastic. Now you have people going at, at the $10 million range to whatever, and even lower in, in that range. And people can go and make a movie there. That means the resources, the technology is getting smaller and cheaper. And the cost of going up there is getting even, even, even lower. So we can at least start trying and throwing stuff up there and see what sticks. And, and I'm sure mistakes will happen. I'm sure. But I also think that it could give us a, a, a chance to allow Earth to, to, to survive, you know? Well, one thing humanity is in no short supply of, and that's visionaries and heroes. And I think that's what's going to carry us into space. So, Will, if everybody's willing, I think that uh, it's time to uh, call this meeting. And uh, it has been a privilege and an honor to have you here. And please, please promise me, if you can promise, that you will be back. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> of course. It sounds like you won't be back until fall, but absolutely. Oh, of course. And I'll make sure that the link gets out to your documentary and to your product lines. I'll talk to Todd because uh, he uh, works with our product lines on our website. We'll, we'll talk between each other about how to interface that if possible. And of course, avoiding trademark and copyright issues. We want to make sure that we support you. Um, and want to thank you for being with us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Todd, we'll be talking later. Reza, I hope to sure. talk to you soon. David Contreras, thank you for joining us. Everybody at Orange County uh, Astronomers and everybody at the Ventura County Astronomical Society here with us tonight, thank you very much. We'll see you all again in September. Good night. Thanks, guys.